the parable before us this morning is a particularly difficult one. It's the parable of the unrighteous steward or the dishonest manager, which you can find in Luke 16, 1 through 13 of your Bibles, or on page 10 of your bulletins. It's particularly difficult in at least three ways. It's difficult to interpret, to hear, and then to apply. One can easily gather that it's difficult to interpret by looking at a handful of commentaries on it, because the interpretations are varied and even contradictory. Writing at the end of the 19th century, one commentator said the literature is voluminous and unrepaying, and it's only grown since then. It's a bit of an overstatement because some of it can be helpful, but it's not entirely off the mark. If we aren't careful, if we press this parable too hard, attempting to extract meaning from every detail, we will walk away from it with only studied confusion. We can learn all about the dynamics of owner-steward relationships in the first century and the benefits of debt remission in an agrarian context and still miss the point of it. Because while the economics of, of how the narrative works are a bit unclear, I think the point of it is quite clear. So it's only when we step back, when we zoom out a bit, that we begin to get a sense of its meaning. But when we do that, that's when we realize another difficulty, that it is a hard word to hear. It's hard to hear because it's about money, and money can be difficult to talk about. In this parable, Jesus calls us to take an honest look at ourselves, to examine both our hearts and our hands when it comes to money. Which brings us to our third difficulty. This parable is difficult to apply because it makes very concrete demands of us. It calls us to see that with the coming of Christ, we have been brought to a moment of crisis, a moment requiring swift, prudent action, and that as children of light, we are to steward the worldly resources that God has entrusted to us with an eye toward eternal dwellings. I'll try to explain that a bit as we go along, but that's my basic point. Christ himself presents us with a crisis which requires decisive yet prudent action in our use of worldly wealth. I think we'll be surprised what kind of action he calls us to, but more on that in a bit. Having acknowledged at the beginning that it's a difficult parable to interpret, to hear, and apply, uh, I should also say that it's, it is a, a good parable to hear. It is a, a good word from the Lord, even though it's difficult. Jesus says elsewhere, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. In this parable, he's reminding us that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and that we have been appointed as stewards of God's good creation to bear witness to the glory of God. When we ponder this truth, the radical generosity of God who owns all of creation and let it stir our affections for him, we in turn can begin to live in open-handed, generous ways that show others the surpassing worth of knowing God through Christ. This, this parable can free us up from anxieties, desires, and ways of life that seek only to steal, kill, and destroy that provide no satisfaction and no possibility of glorifying the one who has called us to himself. So it's a hard word, but it's also a good word. And may the Spirit help us this morning to consider our stewardship of worldly wealth as children of another age, the age of the kingdom of God. Look with me, if you will, then, at Luke 16, verses 1 through 13. I've already suggested as much, but you'll see in verse 1 that Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's been speaking to the Pharisees in chapter 15, and now he's speaking to the disciples, at least primarily. The Pharisees are still in the picture. You can't see it in your bulletins, but verse 14, which will come after our parable, reads, The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. So they're within earshot of Jesus and the disciples. And they're called lovers of money, which when read in light of 
13, which you do have in your bulletins, it means they're not lovers of God. For as it says, no servant can serve two masters. So that's the audience. It's primarily disciples, followers of Christ, and then um, secondarily, it's the Pharisees. They're still in the background, making for a sharp contrast between those who love God and those who love money. Jesus begins the parable by saying, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. As a manager or steward, this man would have uh, been tasked with the distribution and management of his master's resources, as well as entrusted with the full authority to transact business on his manager's behalf, so he would be able to make legally binding decisions. Given his position, then, it's no light charge that's brought against him. He's accused of wasting or squandering his master's possessions. The same words used for the prodigal son in the previous chapter of Luke, he squanders wealth, with the difference being that it's his wealth. The manager here is squandering someone else's wealth, which is clearly grounds for dismissal. So the manager calls to him and says, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And next comes a somewhat humorous but honest soliloquy from the manager who says to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig and I am ashamed to beg. Now the job of a manager was a good one so wouldn't, normally wouldn't expect a manager to transition to the back-breaking role of a digger or the shameful position of a beggar. But this isn't an ordinary career move. The manager isn't uh, leaving his position to explore other opportunities. He's being fired for malfeasance. People, including potential employers, will find out about his dishonorable termination, meaning he's in a dire predicament. Maybe he has a wife and children. Maybe he doesn't. At the least, we know that he himself faces the prospect of extreme poverty. So what does he do in the face of a crisis? He makes an honest assessment of his situation. He isn't strong enough to dig, and he's ashamed to beg. And then he acts. Look with me at verses 4 and seven, four through 7. In these verses, the manager has a eureka moment, saying, I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. Whatever the moral character of his actions may be, he acts decisively in the moment of crisis with an eye toward the future. And this is what crises force us to do. They wake us up to reality and make us uh, to be honest with ourselves about our situations. That's what the manager's doing in verse 4, being honest about his situation in light of a crisis. The text then reads, So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. Remember, as a manager, he has full authority to transact business on his master's behalf, meaning these transactions are legally binding. So he summons his master's debtors one by one and remits part of their debt all for the purpose of making friends, which he knows he will soon need. Without a doubt, the most confusing part of the parable comes next in verse 8. It says, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. Why would the master commend the manager for writing off huge amounts of his debtor's debts? That's money that the master was owed and now will never see. This is where the parable gets tricky because we don't know enough of what we should know about the economics of the time to parse out exactly how this narrative works. So various explanations have been offered as to why the master commends the manager, many of them being attempts to recuperate the manager's image. Some commentators would say that the manager is protecting the master from usury, that is from charging exorbitant interest, which is expressly forbidden in the Old Testament. Uh, but still, it was common practice to get around it by charging debts in the form of commodities, provided the person already had a small amount of that commodity, you could include it in the bill, and that was kind of a way to shirk those 
Old Testament prohibitions against exorbitant interest. So some suggest that. Maybe he's actually helping the manager out. Others say the manager only remits his part of the pie. Maybe he added a bit on top of this interest and he's just going around cutting that off. And so winning praise for the master and also um, saving his job, preserving the master's honor because now the master is not going to get a bad rap around town for having um, a, a manager who squanders his wealth. And so it'd be a, a win for everyone. Still further, uh, which is somewhat similar to these mentioned, especially the last one, some have argued that a partial debt remission, which wasn't uncommon in those times, would have encouraged loan repayment by the debtors, who are presumably tenant farmers, by making their debts more manageable. So kind of a psychological thing, the debt's smaller. OK, now I'm actually going to try and pay it off because it seems manageable. Uh, as well as one praise and honor for the master on account of his generosity, which was highly valued in the culture, and save the manager's neck. So it would have been a win-win-win. But at this point, I think we've gotten too deep in the weeds. And as I said in the beginning, risk leaving only with studied confusion. This is often what happens when we press parables too hard trying to extract meaning from every detail. True, we don't know enough about the economics of the time to explain beyond the shadow of a doubt how the narrative works. But I think the point of the parable is clear. If we zoom out just a bit, as well as consider the verses that come after, we can get some sense of why the master commends the dishonest manager, and more importantly, why Jesus uses him as a positive example for the disciples, despite his unsavoriness. I personally think it's best to sidestep the question about the morality of the manager's actions in verses 5 through 7. Yes, he is called dishonest in verse 8. Note that that's by Jesus, not the master. But that could be on the basis of the wasting or squandering that he's accused of in verse 1, so what he's already done. We just don't know to say exactly, so I think it's best to, um, to not, because I think the point of the parable is clear, and the reason he is commended is also clear. The text simply says that the master commends him for his shrewdness, so maybe the manager's actions in verses 5 through 7 were financially and culturally advantageous for the master. Maybe they weren't, but, and the master can't help but admire the cleverness of a rascal who got one over on him. Either way, though, the point is that the manager acted decisively in the moment of crisis with an eye toward the future. That's what he's commended for his shrewdness or prudence, his ability to make good decisions and act accordingly. And that's where the parable proper ends. So in the second part of verse 8, Jesus begins to comment on the parable saying, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. As an aside, I should point out that Although I said it's probably best to remain silent on the question of the morality of the manager's actions in verses 5 through 7, uh, in this point, the manager is called the son of this world. So despite the moral ambiguity of verses 5 through 7, I don't think we should think too highly of him. Returning to the last part of verse 8, though. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Jesus is making the point that sons of this world often show more concern and skill for matters that are of no eternal significance than sons of light show for matters that are of eternal significance. Let me say that, but a bit differently. Jesus is making the point that secular people often show more concern and skill for matters that are of no eternal significance than believers show for matters that are of eternal significance. So there's a contrast and a comparison to be made between Jesus' disciples and the dishonest manager. Jesus is not saying that his disciples should be dishonest in their dealings. Far from it. He is saying, though, that they might learn a thing or two from the manager's prudence, his practical know-how. As Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Be prudent, but not dishonest. 
as to why Jesus uses a morally dubious figure to teach his disciples, it's to surprise us. He does this elsewhere in the Gospel of Luke, and there's a certain kind of logic to these parables. We saw it a few weeks ago in Luke 11 when Clint taught on the parable of the persistent friend, which was about prayer. Jesus says there, What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Or, although we haven't looked at it this summer, consider the parable of the unjust judge, which comes two chapters later in Luke 18. A persistent woman repeatedly asks an unjust judge to render a just verdict against her adversary, and he finally relents, saying, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And then the Lord says, hear what the unrighteous judge says. Will not the Lord give justice to his elect who cried to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. So it's the, it's the logic of how much more. If even earthly fathers give their children good gifts, how much more will our heavenly father give us? If even an unjust judge will give justice, how much more will God give justice to his children? Or to take today's parable, if a dishonest manager, a son of this world, shows such care and skill for his earthly future, how much more should Jesus' disciples show for eternity? How much more? This care and skill, though, this shrewdness, isn't individualistic or parochial. Look at verse 9. Jesus says, And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Now, Jesus is not saying we should make friends by means of wealth we've acquired in shady ways. Not at all. Unrighteous unrighteous wealth is a foil for true riches in verse 11. The underlying Greek word for unrighteous can loosely be translated as untrue, So I think one of the connotations of it is, speaking of transience and permanence, we have unrighteous or temporary wealth and true riches or eternal riches. And Jesus tells us to make friends for ourselves by means of unrighteous or worldly wealth, earthly wealth, so that when it fails, and money will fail us all uh, in one way or the other, could be by not having enough, or by having enough and not satisfying us, but the way that it will fail all of us without doubt, unless Christ comes before then, is that we will die and our money won't be any good for us then. But Christ is saying in this parable, there's a way to use our money now in light of the world that is to come. That's what's going on in verse 9. And isn't it interesting that when Jesus calls us to use our money now, in light of eternal dwellings to come. He's suggesting we make friends. He's telling us to make friends. He doesn't call attention to pearly gates or streets of gold, but rather friends. He's saying, use your resources here and now in such a way that when you pass into eternal dwellings, others will be there to receive you with thanksgiving and gratitude. Others who benefited from your generosity and who are now with you in eternal dwellings, others you can call friends. So he's saying live in an open-handed, generous way that reflects the reality that this is not your home. You were bought with a price, and you now have an eternal dwelling. With an eye toward the future, yours and others seek to love others here and now in tangible ways. Love, after all, is what eternal dwellings or heaven is about. And I don't mean in some vague, sentimental way. I I have something else in view. You might have heard of the 18th century Puritan preacher, Jonathan Edwards. He once gave a sermon entitled, Heaven is a World of Love. He begins by establishing that God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit 
is a great cause and fountain of love in heaven and goes on to talk about the love we will experience there from and for God as well as from and for others. There will be no unrequited, insincere, or to use Edward's phrase, clogged expressions of love. That's when you have uh, an ocean of love in your heart, but it comes out through a straw towards others because of selfishness and pettiness and other reasons. Those are clogged expressions of love. Moreover, there, the burdens we experience on account of fellow Christians we love who are hurting will be no more, for there will be no more death, sorrow, crying, or pain. That's to say, love here is often more a cause of pain than joy in life because we share others' burdens uh, whom we love. And so when they're hurting, we hurt. And if you love more than, say, five people, then you're in pain a lot. But there, there won't be any of that. There we shall enjoy each other's love in perfect and undisturbed prosperity. And I think that's what we want. It's um, to be loved and to love without the hurt, fear, and confusion that attend our relationships in this life on account of sin. And that's what we need, too. It's where the Beatles got it right. All you need is love. As even the dishonest manager realized, relationships are important, much more so than money. And I, I think we know this, and in the moment of a crisis, uh, affirm it to be true. Perhaps you've heard someone say before, my beach home was destroyed by the hurricane, but I'm glad my children are all right. I mean, we know this, I think. The relationships are more important than things. And crises show us that, force us to be honest. But what we need is love, and the scriptures say that God is love, so above all else we need Him. And He's created us to need others, to be in relationship with others, to love and to be loved by friends. So you might be thinking by now, what does all this talk of love, heaven, and Jonathan Edwards have to do with the parable of the unjust steward? I'm getting there. Edwards writes, If you would be in the way to the world of love, so he's talking about now, you must live a life of love, a life of love to God and love to men, a frame of holy love to God and Christ, and a spirit of love and peace to men, greatly disposes and fits the heart for a sense of the excellence and sweetness of heavenly objects. And those heavenly objects are persons, so God and then others, other people. It gives us a relish of them. It, seeking to love others here and now, opens the windows by which the light of heaven shines in upon the soul. So he's talking about this world now, to put it a bit more succinctly, to live a life of love is to engage in, as he says, an exercise of heaven in your heart. Heaven is a world of love, and the clearest evidence to a title to heaven is a life of love now, love of God and love of people. And when we encounter the love of God in Christ, it changes us, it allows us to begin to love others in open-handed, generous ways. The problem, though, is that because of our sin, our loves are disordered, and we're tempted to love things rather than God. Jesus warns us of this in verses 12 and 13, which I encourage you to look at, saying, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other, you cannot serve God and money. Unrighteous wealth is so-called not only because it's temporary, but because we're tempted to make an idol of it. That's the kind of language being used here in verses 12 and 13, the language of idolatry. Here, money has become personified, even deified, and demands service. We're tempted to serve it by chasing it, 
And if we get some, squandering it for our personal gratification and selfish purposes, it could even be for good things, uh, just not necessarily things that will last. But for the disciple of Christ, this cannot be. As Christ himself says, the greatest commandment is that we shall love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind. And the second greatest commandment is that we shall love our neighbor as ourselves. Here's the connection then between the stewardship and the, the love bit, the Edwards bit. How we use our money helps us to see how we're doing loving God and loving others. Luke says earlier, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where we put our money, that's what we care about. That's what we love. And we also have to realize that our money, along with our life, breath, and being, is from God. In Psalm 24, the psalmist says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Like the rich man, God has entrusted us with worldly wealth to steward for the sake of his kingdom. Like the dishonest manager, we are to be shrewd or prudent in our use of it, for one day we will have to give an account of our management. and We don't want to be found having squandered it. So we have to ask ourselves, am I seeking to make friendships that will last? Do I show as much, no, do I show as more concern and skill, even creativity and ingenuity in seeking to be radically generous toward others as I do in trying to do my job and advance my career? Does my proverbial, proverbial or actual, depending on your age, checkbook agree? That is, if I look at how I use my money and time, what kind of honest assessment does it force me to make about my situation and about myself? And we must be honest about our situation. Like the dishonest manager who receives word of his dismissal, all of us come to a moment of crisis when we encounter Jesus. As he himself says at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, the time is now and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the Gospel. We must make a decision when we encounter Jesus. The decisive, prudent action to make in the face of Christ's coming is first and foremost to repent of sin and believe the gospel. But having done that, it's to live with an eye toward the coming future, which, as we see in this parable, involves being radically generous with the resources that God has entrusted to us with the hope of making friendships that will last. We must choose this day, though, and really every day, whom we will serve, God or money. Will we be faithful and honest in a very little Will we be faithful in that which is another's? Our main motive for stewarding our resources well, though, should be love. John 3.16 begins, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. Or Romans 5.8, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Or, one more, Consider Paul's appeal to the Corinthians to send financial relief to those suffering in Macedonia. In 2 Corinthians 8, he says, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Christ emptied himself for our sake to make friends from himself for himself who were once enemies and he did so out of love. May we too seek to further the purposes of God's kingdom by making friends by means of unrighteous wealth. That is by using our worldly resources to meet the earthly needs of others, to share the gospel with them and to pray that they come into the kingdom. And one day, by the grace of God, May they be there to receive us into eternal dwellings with thanksgiving and gratitude as friends. And may we too hear a word of commendation from our master. Well done, good and faithful servants. I'm going to pray for us and then let's take a moment to silently reflect. 
Father, thank you for this text before us this morning. I pray that your spirit would cause it to work its way into our hearts and to um, give an honest assessment of how we are stewarding the resources you have given to us in light of Christ, whom we encounter and who um, calls us to make a decision, Father. And out of love, may we seek to use our resources to love others and ultimately love you, Father. We pray all this in your Son's name. Amen.